morning, everybody. I'm Andrea Potter, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you all to our very first TripSpark Summit. We're really excited. Um, we're really hoping that everyone enjoyed last night. We had a few guests at it that, you know, so we had Sophia and Corona, which I thought was typically um, named. We took Jaime's s'mores virginity last night, and so we, we had a lot of fun. Yeah. So we're, I had an opportunity to meet a number of you last night. If not, though, please feel free to approach me or the rest of our team. And really, we're here to help you and to entertain you to some extent. I'm going to go through some housekeeping things initially. Um, so first of all, I really want to thank our entire TripSpark team, the ones that are here as well as back in the office. People have worked really hard to pull this together. Particularly, I'd like to thank Heather, who's our events coordinator, which I think is in the back. So if we could give an applause for Heather. So Heather, Heather has worked very hard, and I particularly have stressed her out. So we really appreciate that. And anybody who knows me is very familiar with that concept. So um, some housekeeping things. You'll notice that we are all in gray today. So we are easy to find. Please feel free to approach anybody in the gray. Um, and then tomorrow, we're in blue. So we, again, we'll be easy to find. Um, we have, if you can approach any of us for any questions you have, like I said, the gray or the blue guys, today or tomorrow, we will be wearing them all day. We also have a customer care um, booth that's out in the main hall. Out there, you can ask anything about your tickets, log things, or you could just want to know what's going on at the conference or in the area. Please feel free to go there. We've also got coffee, tea, iced tea, lemonade throughout the day. So if, you know, keep hydrated. It is hot here during the day, but the rooms are quite cold. So you might want to get a sweater for those. Um, we also have an innovation center across the hall, which is where you can go for all of your technical needs. So those are going to be staffed during breaks and lunches. Please feel free to talk to any of our, our staff there, as well as we've got an internet cafe if you need to check email or anything, or your Facebook or whatever, at the back of the Mojave. So it's across the hall. And that, again, will be open breaks and lunches. Um, just to let you know what's going on, where you had breakfast this morning, we're going to have all of our breakfasts and lunches, and then dinner on Tuesday night will be out on the Litchfield lawn where we were last night, just so you know where to go, and the agenda's all in, all the timings in your agenda on your name tag. So, is everybody ready? We are going to get started, so, okay, so, we are... Hopefully everybody had their coffee, their tea, or their M&Ms this morning. We're getting started. Um, we're hoping everyone's excited. We have a lot of people here from all the different transportation industries. We're all here to make our operations better. Um, although everybody does things a little differently, we all have a lot of similarities. So we have people from fixed route in this room, people from non-emergency medical, people who operate uh, paratransit operations, K-12 school buses, and rideshare carpool. Again, a whole bunch of things that are very dissimilar, but there's a lot of commonalities. We all want to make our operations better, and we all want to learn from each other. So a lot of the value comes from interacting over breakfasts or lunches and really find out what people are doing and how they do things, because we are constantly amazed on things that we learn from one part of our industry that we can apply to another. So, what can you expect? Getting the most from your summit. Whether you're a first time summit attendee or you're confident around a shrimp cocktail station, it's important to refresh yourself on the top five steps to attending a summit. Step one, show up. If you're reading this, congratulations, you've achieved step one. Take a break, but don't forget to keep showing up, like to the sessions. Step two, sign up and attend the sessions. You are guaranteed to get some valuable knowledge, in-depth training, and generally justify the reason why you're here. Step three, meet up and get to know someone new. They don't have to be your soulmate, but they may have valuable insight. This goes for our people too. Please give us your feedback about anything that we can do to make your summit more enjoyable. Step four, snack up. Make sure you grab a bag of our specially made M&Ms. And don't listen to the advertising. These guys will melt anywhere, your mouth, your hand, this dog. Step five, get up and go home. If you're reading this and it's Thursday, then you've stayed too long. Someone who cares about you is probably looking for you, so go home. 
thank you, and please enjoy your summit responsibly. Okay, seriously though, um, we have a quirky guy in our marketing department, obviously. So, um, <laughs> Uh, there's the reason you're all here is to really participate in the tracks. We have a lot of good sessions going on. Um, the first session of, of all of the tracks is what's new. What's new in the products? What have the product managers and all the tech guys been adding to the product over the last year and what's coming? So participate in those. We have a feedback session at the end of the conference on Tuesday afternoon. Really give us feedback on the product, the summit, um, the solution, things you wish we did, things you wish we didn't do. Please give that input, that is great, and we will only improve um, by hearing that. Uh, we've also got some other cool sessions like in-vehicle technologies for school as well as for paratransit and fixed route. Um, we've got sessions on data management. We've got a session on how to market your customer-facing applications to your riders. So we provide the technology, but what we found is a lot of clients don't know how to tell their riders about it. So we actually, one of our marketing guys put um, something together on how you can market it to your riders so you can get the your riders using it, which means then they're using your transportation more effectively. So participate in that. So we really do, we have a lot of great sessions. And we're really hoping that you, know, you participate in those. So our goal at this, um, as a company of TripSpark, is we really want to take what we learn and make your lives better. We look at a whole bunch of different industries to see how we can do that. We have Cameron Laird, who's our Director of Technology Development at TripSpark. He obviously has a professional interest in people transportation, but in reality, Cameron's just interested in technology in general. So what he learns, he actually brings to work to apply across the industry. So Cameron's going to speak about um, basically convergence, ideas on how various industries can come together and help make our lives better. So he's a little quirky too, so you'll get that. So welcome, Cameron. <laughs> right here. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for that um, introduction, I think. Um, so, uh, so I've been asked to come and speak to you guys um, and share some uh, stories and things about technology and how they apply to transit. So I hope, um, I hope you enjoy, um, and uh, I'll give you kind of a hint on some of the stuff we're going to talk about. These are a lot of really sort of big and highly technical topics that um, are really kind of boring. Um, but uh, I think they're really interesting ways of, of communicating what's happening with technology and how we can apply it in, um, um, in transit. And, you know, I say, I say they're kind of scary because they are really big topics and they're, they're things that a lot of people talk about. But I don't think you guys are really going to be scared about these types of topics because you're all early adopters of technology and um, you're part of the evolution of transit technology because you're here. Um, so I, I felt kind of comfortable um, talking about these things with you. Um, so, this keynote really is going to be about you, but I'm also going to talk about tomatoes, and I'm going to talk about Disney World, and I'm going to talk about farming and unused TV signals, and we're going to talk about Chinese social media, uh, and so at the end of the day, this, this sub, sum, uh, at summit and the, the keynote is really about you. Um, and I hope to be able to, at the end of the keynote, tell you what these, all things, these things all have in common. So. Um, so on with my carefully crafted story. So I'm going to start off. Uh, two years ago, we gave a presentation at the CTAA. Um, and it was a presentation that was really kind of, it was meant to be funny. Um, and we looked at the future of transit and the future of technology from somebody who lived in the, in the 1950s. And uh, we talked about the flying car and all these wonderful things. Um, and we talked about the future of a city um, in which transit was really all coordinated by technology. And how it could connect riders and it could connect transit and you know, even maybe the, the asphalt would have some internet in it and it could communicate with autonomous vehicles and electric buses and all this wonderful stuff. But if you think for a second about that, you can sort of get an idea of why it's so funny, right? Because we have all these things. We have um, you know, connected people. We've also all got smartphones in our pockets and we're connected in a whole bunch of ways. We have autonomous cars, whether you like it or not. And um, I've seen uh, autonomous buses on the internet, so I think those must be real too, because um, the internet doesn't lie. Um, so, um, so we have all these things. The joke really is that 
Um, we've got all these things that can make this wonderful utopia of technically enabled transit. They just don't really talk to each other very well. So I don't know how many people are familiar with the Hyperloop, but it's something that Elon Musk talks about a lot. Um, and really what it is is this um, hovering electric high-speed railway that's you know, it's poised to replace air travel, travel and you know, everybody can get across the country in, in, a, in a moment's notice and, um, and it's, it's going to be environmentally friendly and all these wonderful things. So that, that's the Hyperloop and I, this is kind of an interesting topic too because if you connect this with the idea of having every transit moment of anybody in a city connected and coordinated and planned all at once, you know, you can, you can have this um, super efficient system where you can get trips really fast and they can be really fuel efficient and you, you can sort of connect all these things together and have this fantastic story. And you can get trips really, really fast and you can get across the country really fast. And, and faster even, I think the only thing faster would be a hoverboard, which I, I, I back to the future too, if you're not uh, paying attention. But I, I, I really like real hoverboards, not these silly electric skateboards that everybody was breaking their arms on at Christmas time last year. Um, the, real, the real thing would be better for me. So, um, so this Hyperloop enables us to imagine um, you know, an entire end-to-end -end trip um, being plotted and paid for in this sort of single uh, instance where I, you know, um, I have this vehicle that shows up at my door and uh, I hop on the Hyperloop and it takes me across the country to Phoenix and then I get off and it takes me to my final destination and anybody can live wherever they want and they can work anywhere else and the choice is really up to you because you can travel so efficiently and so smoothly. And this is a concept that really hits home for me because um, of where I live. I live um, not far from our Toronto office um, and it's about 18 miles, give or take a kilometer or two. Um, and uh, nobody got the metric humor. Not a single laugh. Um, but anyway, to get to work every day, I take a highway called the 401. Um, and uh, my uh, commute every morning and every afternoon kind of looks like this. This is actually the 401. Um, and this little stretch of heaven is 515 miles of highway that runs from Quebec all the way through Ontario to the Michigan border. Um, and the part that runs through the Toronto area is actually Interesting, this is stats time, so if you're going to write something down, write this down. Um, there will be a test. Um, the, uh, the stretch that runs through the Toronto area is actually the widest and busiest highway in the world. The world, not Canada, not North America, the world. Um, and I didn't know this, but roughly uh, half of Canada's population lives along the corridor that this highway runs through. So it kind of gives you an idea of why it takes me over an hour to drive those 18 miles each way, because it looks like this all the time. Sunday morning, it looks like this, typically. It's terrible. Um, so, you know, to me, the solution like the Hyperloop that provides this sort of end to congestion and, tra and traffic and pollution and car insurance and all these kind of things, you know, it, it sounds great and it sort of creates this perfect organism of, of transportation. And because we're not all spending our lives you know, wasting away in a car commuting every day, um, we're, you know, we're never going to get old and we're never going to die. 80s reference number two, if you're keeping score. So, uh, uh, and that's Steve Gutenberg, <laughs> if you don't know who he is. Um, so now it's been a, it's been a couple of years. Uh, I don't think many people know who he is anymore. Um, so it's been a couple of years now in that presentation. It kind of seems like less of a joke, right? Um, you know, we seem to be talking less about the flying car, but we're talking more about solutions that are smarter and more fuel efficient and, um, you know, all around kind of smart. Um, the reason why the future is becoming more of a likelihood is because of technology. And there's technology everywhere that's kind of being, uh, you know, brought into transit and transportation and, and being reused. Um, and the internet is really at the heart of things. So it's not so much about the internet. I mean, we're all familiar with it. We use it every day. It, but it's more about how we're connecting into it and things connecting into the internet. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Internet of Things, um, which is an interesting topic. Um, and the way that I describe it at its most basic, it's just a microphone, is that it's, um, you know, it's an Internet that connects objects and allows objects to kind of tell their own story. And that's how I like to, to describe it at its most basic. I come from the logistics world, as Andrea indicated. I'm not a transit guy. I'm, I don't move. I didn't used to move people. I moved boxes. And um, it, there's a lot of similarities between the things that you strive for in transit and the things you strive for in logistics. 
Um, and when we were focused on track and trace, and that's, that was the most important thing to us, was real-time information and connecting various carrier systems together to string together this narrative, uh, we would have loved to have boxes that could just tell their story as they move through the, uh, through the supply chain. Um, so I'm gonna use a little example, and I think I indicated before, where's my mouse? I have this animation. I'm gonna talk a little bit about tomatoes. I'm gonna use a tomato as an example. Uh, because produce gets handled a lot. From the time the farmer picks it in the field to packing it and moving it to some you know, place where it gets sold, I don't know how this works, and then it gets moved off somewhere else and consolidated, um, it, it, gets, it, it gets touched a lot. And a lot of times it's getting touched by disconnected entities. So here's a farmer and he loads his tomato into the little truck and the truck moves along and then it gets sold to Heinz ketchup and into a rail car or maybe it's onto a, a retailer where it finally makes its way to the store and then it makes its way to your plate eventually. And we make a beautiful, come on, come on. Where's the last little bit? I know, there's supposed to be Anyway, there's supposed to be a salad at the end of this. And it's, it's, really, it's really pretty. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, I don't know where it is. <laughs> so, um, so that's the end of that. Um, so anyway, um, now I'm completely off. Farm table, okay. Yeah, so we talked about this a lot. We've got all these different people, and they've all got their different systems and different logistics and history and people problems in their organization and all these things that cause, um, you know, it's, it, it can have uh, a situation where in the event that you get a breakdown and your tomato doesn't make it to your salad on time or it's, it's traveling through northern Ontario and there's a snowstorm and it can't go any further, well, what do you do? Well, typically, it's not that cost effective to reroute that tomato and try and get it somewhere else. So you end up destroying a lot of food at the end of the day. That, that can be what happens. So um, where are we here? Why do I have another tomato? I've got two of the same slide. That's the problem. There we go. Probably. I bet you the salad's at the end of this one. <laughs> because my next slide is much more impactful with this. So, so we're going to let this, this salad show up. Come on. Give me a salad. Oh, look, everybody's happy. No salad. <laughs> Let me describe the salad for you, OK? So we have this lovely um, slate plate. And on, the, on there, we have basil and tomato and mozzarella cheese and some balsamic vinegar. It's a caprese salad. It's really nice. And if you um, have to destroy all your tomatoes because they're late, um, goodbye, caprese salad, bottom line, end of the day. It was a really good looking salad. So this whole system really isn't really um, economically or environmentally or socially viable, right? I mean, that's the bottom line. If you got to keep disconnecting things um, to uh, and destroying food, and it's a, it's a big waste. There's a lot of waste in the system, bottom line. So um, if we have all these separate enterprises that are all sort of working in this machine, um, it can be hard for them when they're being competitive with one, an with one another to connect their systems together. That's kind of the message I'm trying to get to you guys um, uh, to form this integrated system. So one of the things that can help this is, is inter interoperability. So if you can find some way to make um, some piece of information kind of universal so that everybody can use it, um, you're no longer competing for that information. And that's where the Internet of Things comes in and kind of helps for us to, uh, to tell this story. And it's really the ability, as the ability to track everything with extreme accuracy and, you know, when you need the information just in time and all that kind of stuff. As it increases, there's going to be more demand for um, for, inter for interconnections between competing systems. So that's, I think that's the, the bright spot of this, is I think as everybody demands more and more of this information, no matter if it's tracking people or tomatoes, I think everybody's going to want to play together. And that's, that's kind of my vision of the future. So if we start again with our tomato, hopefully my last bit of this animation is here. And then, oh, come on, where's my stupid? No, no, pause. Anyway. So we slap a barcode on it with a serial number, and now we want to get this tomato onto the Internet of Things. So what we do is we put that barcode on there, and as the farmer's picking them, he's scanning these barcodes and he's putting them into the box. And these boxes, instead of just being regular cardboard boxes, they're smart boxes. So now the smart boxes can transmit their GPS position in real time. Well, now we can monitor 
the tomato instead of the container. So now we can, and everybody can monitor that tomato because it's always broadcasting. He becomes part of the Internet of Things. And we can watch it tra far, travel from farm to table. And because we're interested in the contents of that box, that's what we're focused on. So transportation at this point can be optimized. We can get the right vehicle to pick up the to, to pick it up and deliver it where it needs to be. We can reroute really easily. So if um, you know if we do encounter weather, we can you know before you hit that weather, you can deviate the the tomatoes somewhere where they're needed, etc. It's all a very cutesy example to show that with more and more information, we can do more with it, um, and we can all be, become smarter with the way we do things. And at the end of the day, we end up with more tomatoes. Ready for movie reference number three? I don't know where all these slides came from. These aren't my slides. I don't know what's happening. This was supposed to be Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, but it's not, so. <laughs> all right, new reference. How about The Simpsons? So this is all good. I mean, I think we've all heard about the Internet of Things. We've all heard about how everything is going to be on the Internet and broadcasting its information at all times. Um, but, and it's going to change the way that things collide and sort of connect together. But it kind of sounds a bit like that utopia again, right, where uh, we're not really sure when this is really going to happen. But if you look, in, there are some sectors where this is already happening. And I use this picture of Homer because they had this episode where they talk about the ultra home, where everything was sort of robotic and connected and everything was automatic for you. And it's really not that far off. Our homes now can be full of products that are on the Internet of Things. Take a look at Nest. Here's a company that's created this whole ecosystem of connected home products. But they only make like three different products. They make a thermostat, they've got a, a camera, and they've got a, a smoke detector. But what's really cool about them is in this home full of things, they've created this software-based ecosystem by creating an open system. So now you can make your other products work with Nest. So you've got your thermostat that's learning when you're home and changing the temperature, and you can dog dial into it from your phone and get off the plane from your winter vacation and change the temperature so it's nice and comfortable when you get home. But your thermostat's also connected to the lock on the front of your door. So now when you lock the door, the thermostat knows you're not home. And the door lock is connected to your doorbell. And the doorbell is, is smart, and it's on the internet. And uh, I'm describing my own house right now. And when you uh, lock the door, it reroutes anybody who rings the doorbell to your phone. So now you can answer the door when you're not home. And your smoke detector is connected to all the lights in your house, because you can get smart light bulbs now. And when the, when the smoke detector detects smoke, all your lights come on. So now you wake up, and you know, and you can, you can go red and all this wonderful stuff. And you can even connect this to your sprinkler system. So if your sprinkler, if your smoke detector detects smoke, it can start dousing the outside of your house or your neighbor's house to make sure that you don't, you know. So all these things are all connected. And you can go today and spend a lot of money and have all of these things in your house. Um, and uh, I think everything is going to be as con controllable in the future as your thermostat, right? It's, it's not just going to be the temperature in your house. And soon your fridge will be able to tell you when you're out of milk. And the carton in the fridge will tell the fridge when it's expiring so that you don't have to go in and your good-for-nothing kids have left an empty milk carton in there. Mine won't even go to the fridge for their own milk, so that's not a problem I have. But uh, I, I think some people's kids get their own milk. So this concept of you know, always connected freight and the always connected home and all these things, you know, they're, they seem great. Um, however, you know, a major impediment is connectivity and access to connectivity. What good is this Internet of Things if we can't get things to send their information to the cloud, right? Um, which is a problem that farmers and rural communities, and I'm sure some of you experience this, where you don't get connectivity in some areas on, on where you're servicing. Um, but there is um, a new technology that's coming out that is uh, poised to kind of help with this, which is, it's called Super Wi-Fi. Um, and what Super Wi-Fi is, is, um, so remember I talked about farmers? This is now the unused TV signal. So on the, I'm going to get really technical for a, real, a quick second. On the UHF and uh, VHF spectrum, which used to be TV signals, um, now that everything's digital, these, these signals are all out there, but they're unused. So now what they're doing is there's companies out there that are leveraging that to transmit the internet. And unlike your router at home, um, which has a range of, or in your office, a range of about 300 feet, and you kind of got to string things together every 300 feet, Super Wi-Fi can actually transmit over a six-mile radius. So if you look at this picture, 
I think this is kind of cool. I think this is a button. So on this picture on the, on the left, all these little dots, these are all tiny little Wi-Fi signals that are coming from traditional routers, right? They're all little tiny 300-foot radiuses of, of internet signal. All of this stuff is all TV white space. So you can see the abundance of signal, and it's not impeded by walls or electronics or appliances or weather the same way that, that your, your typical Wi-Fi is. So you can see why rural communities and farming is really interested in this, right? Because now you can get the signal out to the edge where they weren't previously um, um, serviced very well, or um, previously you would have to use something really expensive like satellite or something customized with cellular or what have you. So in our tomato example, you can have internet out to the field. So now your smart box is sitting there and it can transmit its information and let the farmer know when um, when the box is full and he can call the transit company or the transit companies can bid on picking up that, see where this is all connecting together with transit guys? It's happening, it's happening. So you can, you know, you can imagine this, this situation where um, we've really extended out to the edge where it previously wasn't available. And this is an example of a technology that's available now that's helping to improve things, right? And we don't have to invent anything to do this, it's there. So what this shows us is that bit by bit, the impediments of this super connected system are all kind of going away. They're disappearing. And convergence is becoming a reality instead of some futuristic myth. Um, so imagine now if every, at every corner of every community, every citizen has access to the internet. They can get their hands on your schedule and your AVL data, and they can get all this information you know, how can we, what can we do with that to provide this end-to-end -end solution for them that's, you know, tailor-made for what they, for what they want to do? And imagine a transit system that not only includes fixed route, paratransit, Ubers, and that kind of stuff, but also bike share, ride share, your school buses, um, moving sidewalks factored into how long it takes you to get from point A to point B, even elevators. And imagine that you can pay for your end-to-end -end trip all within one transaction, right? In paratransit, how easy would it be if you didn't have, a, you had this interoperability where a trip was just some piece of data that everybody understood and it could just sort of float around from you know, provider to provider and you could offload it to some other vendor that can do the trip for, for your customer or you can take another one. You don't have to worry about what system you're connected to or what you've got. Is it Trapeze? Is it TripSpark? Is it whoever? Um, it's all sort of universal, right? Um, and this is a problem that I think is Lisa here from Carta. Lisa? Um, this is a problem, you know, that they've kind of faced and it's something I think you're going to be talking about at your round table, right? Sort of data integration and connecting various systems together. Um, so I would encourage you to visit Lisa during her round table. Um, and this really is the secret of the future of transit, right? It's, it's getting uh, every aspect of people transportation, whether it's public or private or NEMT. I'm looking at you, Candy, I see you in the, I don't see very many people, but I can see you. Um, you know, it's kind of the secret. We're getting everything cooperative and working together and that's really the future. Now I get to talk about random subject number three, I think it is, if you're keeping score. This is Disney World. So I've, uh, this is the part where I talk about Disney World. Um, and I want to look at them for a minute because um, I think in terms of customer service and customer experience, I think they've got a really good thing going there. And it's kind of an example of what you can do when money is no object, right? If you can imagine just coming up with a, coming up with a solution that um, will optimize my transit and make my, ride, my customer's experience better, they've really kind of got that. So my family and I have been there a couple of times, and the first time we went there was about three years ago. I have two girls, and they were five and three, and we went to Disney World, and um, you know, what becomes really apparent really quickly is they're really interested in a, as much information about you as possible. So when we got there, we got up and we checked into our room and they gave us, they said, is anybody celebrating anything? And my, my daughter Erin had just turned three, so they said, you know, we said it was her birthday, so they gave us a little button that she wore. And every time you're walking through the park, every employee would say, happy birthday, Erin, every time they saw her. And, um, you know, uh, I think it was my wife's first visit to the park, so she had once said first visit. And they would say, welcome, I hope you have a great first visit. And my daughters were um, at the princess stage, if you're familiar with that stage, and they both were wearing their princess dresses through the park, and every employee would bow to them 
as we were walking through the park. So the, <laughs> it's, they know who butters their bread. It's, <laughs> they do. It's three and five-year-old girls that, that make their parents spend $5,000 to take them to Disney World. Yeah. So um, there was this one occasion that came up uh, where we had dinner or breakfast, very expensive breakfast, in this restaurant called Cinderella's, Cinderella's Royal Table. So all the, all the princesses are there, and they come over to your table, and they get your picture taken, and you get to meet Ariel and all her friends and all this wonderful stuff. So we did that, and then immediately after, we were on a schedule. So as soon as we were done that, we booked it out of the restaurant, and we go across the park to this thing called Ariel's Grotto to meet Ariel, which we had just met at breakfast. <laughs> so we had to go and meet Ariel again, but this is mermaid Ariel. It's different. So we walk into the grotto, and um, we walk in there, and... and uh, Ariel looks at the girls and says, hey girls, good to see you again. I hope you enjoyed your breakfast. And I was floored. I, I, st I turned to my wife, I'm like, how did they know that? <laughs> and I'm thinking that there was a, we had a fast pass, so I'm thinking they knew that we had had breakfast at the royal table, and it's all connected to our account. No, no, uh, I'm much dumber than that. So um, they, uh, my kids were actually holding magic wands that said Cinderella's royal table, and she made a really lucky guess that we had just been at breakfast. But, I mean, it shows that they're really sort of invested in this personalized experience and trying to, you know, try to, and I'm like, how, how we're walking in there, and how are we gonna do this? Because we just saw Ariel as a princess, now we're seeing her as a mermaid. Our kids aren't that dumb. They're, they're gonna figure out that it's two different people, right? So, uh, anyway, so uh, this encounter really stuck out in my mind when I was putting this together because we just came back from our second trip. We were there in August. And Orlando in August is lovely, let me tell you. Um, it's, it's a little warm, uh, if you didn't know. So we went back, and this time what they've done is they've actually applied some technology in this, to make these things even better, as if it wasn't possible before. They've applied some technology to make things even better. And the reason I put up this picture is because the thing that fascinated me the most the two times we were there is their transit system is awesome. It's really, really, really good. Um, and if you look at this, this really doesn't do it justice because Disney World in Florida is 40 square miles. It's the same size as San Francisco. Um, and uh, they operate 263 fixed route buses. And they've got boats and they've got monorails and they've got all this other stuff in there. And on any given day, there's over 100,000 people there. They've got 62,000 employees and on average daily guests is 52,000 people. That's bigger than the city where I live in Ontario. And you know, that's, that's right there. And the great thing about Disney World is that you never wait very long to go on a ride, and you don't ever wait for a bus. There's always a bus there, and it seems like magic um, that you walk out and there's the bus. So we'll talk a little bit about the Disney secret, and how do they do it? It all starts months before you even go on your vacation. So you're you know, with your significant other, and it's late at night, and you're on your laptop in bed, and you book a trip impulsively. Does it sound like I've been through this? You book a trip impulsively to Disney World for a week, um, and uh, then, so now you're talking like six, eight months in advance, you've booked this trip, and they know you're coming, and they know what resort you're staying at. Well, then 180 days before you arrive, they ask you to book all your dinner reservations. So now they know for the seven days you're there where you're eating dinner, 180 days before you get there. And then 60 days before you get there, they ask you to book all your ride reservations. So you get to pick ride reservations the whole time you're there. So now, two months before you get off the plane, they've got a really rough itinerary of exactly what you're doing when you get there. Because if you had to book reservations 180 days in advance, you got no hope of booking one the day of, right? So they know your plans are locked in with some reasonable certainty. What could you do with that kind of foresight? If you could say, I know where anybody's gonna need to be at any given moment so far in advance. You could do a lot, right? I'm, I see nodding heads, I think, a couple of them anyway. Yeah, you could do a lot with that, right? So the key to the secret is they actually strap a tracking device to your wrist. I'm not joking. So they give you this little thing called a magic band, and it's the key to everything you do. It's got your room key, you link your credit card to it, you put all your ride reservations, you pay for everything in the park using this thing. You can unlock the door to your room. It's crazy. Um, and you know, like I said before, the great thing is, is that when you go to catch a bus, there's always one there. It seems like they're always waiting for you. Uh, and it does feel a bit like magic, um, but um, there's really no magic 
behind it at all. So let me take you through a typical day at Disney World with a magic band. You um, get out of bed and you walk through the scorching heat in August to the, uh, the hotel restaurant and you have breakfast and then you pay with your band. So now I scan my band and I pay for breakfast. So now they know where you are in the hotel because you just paid for breakfast. And then you wander out to the transit depot and they've got a really light and lovely little passenger information system up there that shows you that it's five minutes for the bus to the Magic Kingdom and you're just finishing telling your kids that they gotta wait five minutes and a bus shows up because they know there's some event on. So now, and they've got transit supervisors on the ground that are watching the buses, they're timing things. They use paper and pens and radios to do all of their transit planning on the ground. And, um, but you know, they've added another bus to the route. So now they're there to pick you up and you get there. So now you drive off to the Magic Kingdom and you scan to get into the park. So now you've announced where you are. And now you've got a ride reservation. It's, it's a small world, so you book it across the Main Street USA and you make it all the way to a uh, small world and you scan to get on the ride. And then it's lunchtime and you scan to pay for lunch. And then your kids are crying for something, so you scan in the gift shop. And then more rides and you're scanning and scanning and scanning. All day long, you're telling Disney exactly where you are and where you're moving. So if you combine that with the transit supervisors that have been doing all the work on the, on the ground, they've got some AVL system in the bus as well, and they've got CCTV over the entire park. And I'm pretty sure, I was having this conversation with one of our guys this morning, I'm pretty sure they know that you're moving through the park with these stupid bands. Like it's, they, they know an obscene amount about you. And it's, it finishes all the way at the end of the day when you get back to your room and you unlock the door. So now they know you're there. So you've got this sort of model of somebody's day. <laughs> um, and it, uh, it really helps you to accurately predict crowd movements. Um, and uh, if we zoom out into the real world, can we imagine a situation where we can do something like this? I'm looking for shaking heads now. Well, you're wrong, because there's a ton of data. Yeah, that's right. So we, uh, give the man a shirt. He, he held up his phone, he gets a shirt. Cool. Um, so yeah, you, you know, we as, as humans in the modern world, we string together a huge amount of data about ourselves. Um, take, take for example my trip here. It's, it's a long and torrid story that I'd be happy to tell somebody over drinks tonight, but, um, but basically, you know, I left my house in Milton, I got into an Uber with an app, and I went to the airport. And then I got through security and I bought a coffee with a credit card. And then and I, if we had Apple Pay or whatever, I could have paid with my phone. Um, and you know, I scanned onto a flight. And then I landed in Houston and did the same again. Bought a coffee and you know, back onto another plane, back into another Uber when I got here. But it's all disconnected, right? As a traveler, I look at this as a one trip. My leaving my door at home to getting here, that's one trip. But as data, it's two Ubers, it's two flights, it's a bunch of purchases in an airport and a bunch of walking, and it's really not connected at all. I mean, it's connected for me because I see it all on my phone, but to all of the people that are providing that service to me, it's not connected. So, if we combine all this information into a single narrative and you were to share this information across all the different people that are moving me here, where are the choke points in the flow of data? You know, who's not holding up their end of the bargain when it comes to customer service? Um, you know, how do we ensure that this information gets passed to everybody reliably and that everybody holds up their end of the bargain and makes sure that I'm happy as, as a traveler? Um, and our duty as providers of transportation, your duty, is to make sure that we get where we need to go using transit as efficiently as possible for a good price and in comfort and all these wonderful things. So it really kind of behooves us to be competitive with our own information. So back to the logistics uh, example from before, you really kind of, some people don't want to share their good information about people, but I think it helps, we need to find a way to sort of combine everything together to um, find this common technological ground where we can all share this information. So um, our mission should be to improve the lives of the people that are using our services, right? Um, and so it, it is, our duty to find that common ground. So I'm gonna, a little later I'm gonna talk about Chinese social media, which is kind of a fun topic, but it actually ties into this very topic, so I'll, I'll get there in a minute. Um, so, uh, you know, 
there's this vast amount, the other thing about this is that there's a vast amount of unique experience that everybody has, right? We've all got personal preferences, we've got economic situations to keep in mind. There's all these things that, you know, force us down a path, whether I choose to use Uber or I take, you know, the bus from my house to the airport, right? There's, there's a, a choice that I made uh, to do that. And what, um, you know, just like what Disney is able to collect all this information about their people, um, you know, each individual that's in the park every day, and they're tailoring that experience to everybody who's making the choices. You know, you don't have to eat at Disney's restaurants in the park. You can leave and go to McDonald's or whatever, but, you know, we, you can make that choice. Um, they're also improving their efficiency, right, and their customer service by using that technology and they're leveraging it. So they're giving something back to their customers, which is a great tailored experience, but they're also getting something out of it because they can really optimize the use of those 263 buses. So we should be able to do that by using technology that our riders are already using, right? They've got a smartphone in their pocket, most of them, not, maybe not everybody, but say five, ten years down the road, everybody will have something that they can, that they can use. Um, and they're already using a ton of applications outside of transit that are telling a narrative of their day, right? They're using Facebook, they're using Instagram, they're using PayPal, they're buying stuff on Amazon. We're kind of They've got a platform in their pocket. We're just not really leveraging it the best we can. Mike Hall, is Mike here somewhere? Mike? There he is. So Mike's a technology advocate at Hope Network, um, and he's using data in some pretty interesting ways. So also another roundtable for you to, to check out uh, because they're doing some interesting things there at, at Hope Network um, that are proof that you know, the future of transit is this sort of um, integration, and that's really where its success is going to be. So. We talk about all this stuff, but, and we talked about the lack of connectivity and that kind of stuff, but another major topic of conversation is how there's a lack of communication between different systems, and it's a huge stumbling block. So if we look at our Disney example, it's really easy to say, well, that's Disney, right? They've got this walled garden. They've got this utopia that they can do whatever they want because they have unlimited funds and they can do all that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, in this imperfect real world that we all live in, um, there are so many different systems that are being run by different companies that are competing or they have different purposes, uh, and it's a little more difficult to kind of communicate between them. And we hear this at TripSpark every day. Every time we talk to you guys, it's about, I've got a provider that's using system A, and they need us to send data down to system A, and then they're sending it off to B, and then it's got to get back to our system at, at, at Tennessee Carriers. I, you're right there, and you're looking at me so intently, so I'm going to call you out. T-shirt for candy. Ah, oh, a bad throw. Yeah. Um, so um, where was I? So we deal with this every day, um, and you know, we can say the technology is uniting us, but I think it all gives us a little bit of anxiety because there's so many things to consider when you're taking on new technology and how you connect them that it seems like we need something else, right? Um, because things don't speak the same language. So while I was going through these slides, I was also getting prepared to fly here. So I was using one of my favorite sites, which is TripIt. Um, and it was kind of a cool example because I was trying to illustrate this thing here. If you look up at the top of this slide, you can see I can choose to pick three different, four different mechanisms to sign in to TripIt. I can use Facebook, I can use Google, I can use Yahoo. I don't know who would use Yahoo, but you can. Um, <laughs> and, um, and what this really is an example of is that just like with Nest, Software companies are putting their technology out there to say, use it, right? You want to sign in, to, you want to sign in application? I guarantee you that most of your customers are already signing in with Facebook, so I'm going to make, Facebook makes their sign-in thing. And now you start to see this thread connecting things together, right? I've got my Facebook profile over here that tells all about what I'm doing in my life and probably going to Disney World or something. And, um, and then I've got my TripIt where I can buy airline tickets and I can have all my travel plans and all that kind of stuff, and I can also sign into sites to buy food or clothes or music or whatever using that same account. So it's, you know, this technology thing, software is kind of becoming that language that is uniting everything together. And it's a step in the right direction, I think. Um, so, bad segue. I, I promised I was going to talk about Chinese social media, but um, I didn't have a way to transition between the two, so... I'm just going to talk about how bad it was. 
<laughs> so um, if you um, know anything about China and the internet there, um, and if you don't, I'll, I'll help you understand it a little bit. The government blocks about 25% of international um, internet. So really what's happened there is they've got this intranet within China where it's all really sort of tightly controlled um, and it's not influenced by the outside world. But there's an app there that actually is really interesting, which is called WeChat. And this is something that grew out of this, you know, this intranet. Similar to Disney World, where they've got this kind of technology utopia, WeChat is kind of that as well. And it, it is a social media. It's, it's all encompassing. It does a whole lot of stuff. And it do, it, we don't have anything in, in the West that does this, where everything is kind of rolled together. You've got instant messaging calendars, contacts, you've got social stuff in here. This is like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram all together in one application. They've got Skype calling, video calling, video ch group chats, that kind of stuff. But the most, um, most interesting thing is this WePay. And it's this platform that is really kind of cool because if you look at all these services here, you can donate money, you can buy movie tickets, you can see there's transit on here. You can buy rail and flight tickets, taxis, hotels. All in one transaction, I can buy my flight and my hotel and donate money and buy lunch all in a single hashtag, essentially, which is pretty cool, right? This is exactly what I was talking about earlier. Um, you can do everything all within this one universal application. And what's really neat about it is that all of the customers for each of these individual services, their customers are really providing all this data narrative, right? They're describing their day, they're talking about where they are, and they're serving it up to this app called WeChat that is a fully connected, end-to-end -end narrative of somebody's day. Kind of cool, right? And it's all about payments. And the cool thing is, is that here on the internet in the West, we waste our time making things like cat videos and stuff like that go viral and people falling on their faces on hoverboards. But in China with WeChat, they have 650 million users on WeChat. Insane, right? Um, services, products, restaurants, food, movies, they all go viral because people can talk about them and it's part of their social interaction. Right? So the, similar to this, I mean, imagine you get a great experience on transit. Well, everybody's talking about it because that's how they, they pay for their transit is right here in this application. Pretty cool. So our mobile apps for transit today, they're really kind of little silos, right? They are single purpose. But I think it's easy to conceive of a future where that becomes a little tiny component that's rolled up into some other bigger, bigger application. And ideally, people would get to choose how they book their rides. It's not through your application or my application. It's through Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever they like to use. We should be servicing that function up to whatever application we want. So I said you guys know all this stuff. And I, I assume that you've heard about a lot of these things before. And we know about the Internet of Things and big data and all the things that are all happening with the Internet. But what does it all mean, right? And why are we all here? Um, how did I connect all these things together? And why did you bother to spend, in my case, two days traveling across the country to come here, away from home and email and work and all that kind of stuff? Um, we've got all this technology in our pockets. We've all carrying supercomputers around that we can do all this stuff. Why, didn't, why did we choose to come here to have this conversation instead of doing it virtually over the internet? Um, you know. Over the next couple of days, you're going to hear a lot of things, and you're going to be um, learning some stuff, hopefully, about our products. But I hope that you have some good interactions between people, as well as with us, to talk about other things as well, right? Talking about Chinese social media, or the Internet of Things, <laughs> or that kind of stuff. Um, and I think you're going to learn something over the next couple of days. But we also want to make sure that you have some fun. And well, what's fun got to do with it? Well, you know. Um, Fun is really a fundamental building block of creativity and innovation and all that kind of stuff. And they say that play is a kid's form of work. But let's think about the inverse of that for a second. That means that work is our, as adults, our form of play. And I know I'm having fun. But you, this is work for everybody, right? So, um, but anyway, so you know, for us, developing new technology is fun. And talking to you guys is fun, believe it or not. And we like to talk about the things you guys are um, 
talking about and the things that you're learning and the things you're reading about. So um, hopefully you learn something. And um, the reason I started talking about fun and I talk about this is because before I joined TripSpark, I worked for Canada's largest career company. I talked about logistics and that kind of stuff. And um, that sounds fun, right? Um, but it's, it's, not, it's not really. It's just a job. Uh, but when I, when I joined that company, I worked for this guy who was, um, he was really uh, passionate about us getting together. You know, we all had to have, we had lunch together a lot, and um, we had these little think tanks over lunch, and we'd go to his house for dinner, and he would buy lobster and that kind of stuff. We would have these fun dinners and that kind of stuff. But it wasn't until I left that I realized that those were all engineered to get us working together and becoming close and becoming friends so that we would come up with cool stuff. So there's this other situation when I worked there that I wanted to talk about because it's kind of, it's kind of interesting in that we used to spend a lot of time in a sorting plant, which is late nights, it's dirty, it's loud, it's terrible. I used to tell my mom I would take my youngest sister, who's 13 years younger than me, I would take her there if she ever said she wanted to drop out of school because I said, this is your future. <laughs> it's working here in August in the scorching heat. But we watched this guy um, who was taking boxes off a conveyor belt and he's putting them on a cart. And he'd load the cart up until it was fully loaded and he'd push it over the warehouse and he'd unload them and he'd put them on a scale and he'd scan them and put them aside and then he'd load the cart back up again and he'd push it across the warehouse to the door where it was going into the truck where all the stuff was going. So that night after it was like 11.30 at night we went out for beer and chicken wings and we were all sitting around talking about this guy who was wasting his time and wasting his life pushing stuff around and we actually came up over beers and chicken wings that night on a napkin the very first thing that we patented, right? So it's kind of an ex just a, an example to say, like, this kind of technology, it all comes out of these, these types of interactions. Um, and here at, at TripSpark, we hold a code fest every year that we send our developers off to have some fun and work on a project. And what they do is the, the development team will all put together um, um, a bunch of plans, the different projects, and they'll pitch them to management, and we'll look at them and say, oh, we think this is the one to go with, and then they will learn some new technology and apply it to that problem. And these problems typically aren't the big ones, right? They're not the things that are highest on everybody's list or roadmap, but they're important enough that they need some, you know, some attention, and most importantly, they're driven by the development team, something they want to work on. So what we do is we send them away, and we, we rent them a house or a condo or something in some exotic locale. This was in a rental house in Vegas that nobody left the entire time they were there. Um, and we send them off and they play video games together and they eat and cook together and they joke and laugh and drink Red Bull and do whatever developers do, including <laughs> coding in the dark instead of sleeping. Um, and they, they go you know, for a whole weekend, end to end, from Friday until Sunday when they leave, they don't sleep, they just go through this. And what comes out is some pretty cool stuff. Some of you may have seen my ride. As a, that was the product of a code fest, right? The initial versions of the new uh, MyRide application came out of a code fest. And what these guys do is they come back and they're so passionate, they pour their hearts and souls into these projects. Um, and the most important thing is that they bring a lot uh, along with them some camaraderie, right? They've worked together over a weekend and tackled some tough challenges and they've, they've, they've had some fun together at the same time and it helps them innovate every day. So at the end, this philosophy, it kind of carries us here to the Ignite Summit, right? And all these technical innovations I've talked about, all of these things that, uh, uh, that we, we need for this future of transit and this utopia, they all were, they were, none of them were invented in a vacuum. They were all through interactions like this where people are getting together and they've got an idea, they've got some mutual um, connection between them and they start talking about stuff. And then you end up with this really cool uh, innovation. So really, nothing is a waste of time if you use the experience wisely. And coming here together, we hope that this interaction will get us all talking together and coming up with something neat. So our um, motto for this summit is ideas start here, but we also would like you to have fun and have fun start here too, right? So while you're here, make sure that you have some fun, whatever you consider fun. I don't know what that is. Um, you know, you could meet some people, you could have a couple of drinks, go for a swim, play golf. I think there's cactuses to touch outside. <laughs> you, could, you could eat gluten, live large. 
whatever it is that you consider fun, do it in moderation. Uh, and, but be sure to share that fun with somebody else, okay? So take somebody with you and have fun with somebody else because it's always more fun when you um, do it together. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm sure you've all got a question. You know, what are all these things um, have in common? Well, they're all topics that really will help us start the conversation, right? They're really not connected that, it's a weak connection between all these topics, I admit it. But, um, you know, I think it's a good conversation to have um, and, and it's gonna help us discuss the future of technology. So over the next couple of days, we're going to be talking about the stuff that you do every day in your daily lives. But, you know, you may have seen a video about some cool technology, or maybe you've read a blog or an article about something that's happening in technology. And even if you think there's just a little tiny tidbit of usefulness in it, bring it up and share it with somebody. Because here, you know, every, day, every idea matters. There's nothing, you know, off the table. Let's see what sticks. So make sure that you share these things, um, you know, because every technology matters, no matter where it's applied. Um, so let's get started, because ideas start here. So thank you for listening to my wordy speech. Thanks, everybody.